Hello, New Egg viewers. Juan Carlos Bagnell here in New Egg Studios to talk about new thread rippers and what you're going to put that thread ripper into. So I could think of no better guest to walk us through what's going on at Gigabyte than Matt, our Oris buddy, uh, and this monster board that we've got right here. As much as I'd love to just, you know, kind of share some holiday stories and, and <laughs> chat for a while. Absolutely. We want to jump right into this hardware because this new Threadripper is blown up review sites. And this is a board that looks like the premium option for powering and connecting everything to your Threadripper chip. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. Um, I'm super excited about this board, about Threadripper in general. Uh, it's been kind of a buildup. I think I alluded to it last time we were here. <laughs> I uh, always get one good tease out of you and you're like, oh, okay, well, he couldn't tell us too much. Oh no, he actually did tell us like, really what you guys were gonna do. Yeah, if you ever go back and watch the last video and compare it to this video, you'll see little hints. Right in there, yeah. it's great. Yeah, I try. <laughs> so this is an awesome platform. I think the last time we were talking about X570 yeah. and the interesting thing is that a lot of the stuff that we built into X570 came from the R&D that we did on these boards. So we were really forward thinking with a lot of the features we put into it. Mm -hmm. And we were talking off camera. I mean, there's literally nothing else we could really add to this board to make it any more powerful. So now, I, I want to take a step back because we're going to dig deep into the board, but we're dealing with a new, um, uh, with a new generation of Threadripper, TRX40 Extreme. Mm -hmm. What is it that you think, especially since you've been working with these for a while, what is it that you think makes this a significant upgrade over the last gen Threadripper? Well, I think a lot of it is the uh, maturity of the platform. So AMD, when they first released Threadripper, it was just 16 cores, 32, you know, like yeah. what are we gonna do with all this processing power? And I <laughs> right. think a lot of that has become refined. And so what they did is they, they built it into this new socket and they enabled all the new features. So the one that jumps out is obviously Gen 4, right? Yeah. PCIe Gen 4 through your M.2 for your graphics cards. And so when you're gonna build a platform like this, you're not gonna be replacing it next year, right? right? You want it to last a little while and you want to get something out of it in terms of your workload. It's not a gaming board, it's not a gaming platform, right? Chances are that you're using this for some kind of productivity that you're gonna make money off of, right. maybe it's a hobby, but you're not sitting down playing Fortnite with this thing, right? <laughs> I mean, you could. Yeah, of course, of course, you know. Um, after hours, whatever, when you're rendering a video. So. While you're rendering a video, yeah. you can also fire up some Fortnite. Yeah, so I think this is all of the um, things that we learned from the first two Threadrippers, a lot of what we learned through Ryzen, and then we kind of put it together in one package. Now, because Aorus is the, the sort of the premium label, mm -hmm. the, the upscale label, were those the technologies that that internally you guys were really focused on that you were excited about this new platform? Yeah, so Oris is always considered our premium gaming brand, right? We had to put Oris on this board just because of the premium features of the board, right? right? Um, like I said, we didn't design it to be a gaming board, but we designed it to be the ultimate workhorse. So things like the 16 core VRM, like if you look at this heat pipe. <laughs> that's insane. Right, so and little <laughs> things that you wouldn't necessarily notice. So most high-end motherboards have a heat pipe, right? Mm. And most of them are around six millimeters. We had to put an eight millimeter on this because it just has to be that one step above, right? right? And so that's kind of the Oris difference is that we took what we normally do on a high-end platform Form and just went one or two steps above that. So this whole thing is powering your CPU, right? Right. Um, on X570, we had 16 phases. Mm -hmm. This one we still call 16 phase, even though there's really 19. Okay. So you have 16 for the CPU and three for the memory on each side. Gotcha. Oh, okay, so in, in, in terms of what's actually being put through the board, it's 16 phase, but then we still needed the additional uh, heat management um, for, the, for the RAM as well and stability, right? right? So you have eight sticks of memory on here as compared to like X570 where you have four. So X570, our extreme has 14 for the CPU, two for the memory. Gotcha. This okay. one we got 16 for the CPU and three for the memory. So uh, there, there does seem to have been a, a good continuity of education moving from X570 to this new, to this new socket here. Yeah. So we, we took a lot of what we learned from X570, even X470 and built it into this. We really had to sit down and think, who's gonna use this and what features are you actually gonna use, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, we can throw, you know, obviously put some RGB on there, but it's really <laughs> about the connectivity. Thank you for keeping it simple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, well, so it's clean. I, 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 I have a hard time with sort of a, a unicorn puke mm -hmm. approach to some of the RGB that you see. And there's something about Threadripper that for me, psychologically, plenty of people will disagree with me. I, I'm looking at a more minimal workstation build, not the most vibrant on my desk, um, looks good on my stream kind of a hardware platform. Right, and so there's some kind of balance in between there, right? right. Because there are some people that are gonna have this on their stream totally. and still want you know, some RGB lights, but we think most of the use cases is gonna be as a workhorse, right? It's a, uh, a pickup truck, it's a, a semi truck, it's something that you're gonna use for work, right? So you don't need it to be flashy and blingy, you need it to get done um, you know, whatever workload you're putting on it. Now, as aside from some of the power and thermal management here, what are some of the other features that set the extreme apart from some of the uh, other TRX40 motherboards that are out there? Well, so this is actually a quite large board. This is XL ATX, so it's even <laughs> bigger than EATX. And we had to do that for two reasons. First, just to fit on the power delivery at the top. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that if you're gonna use this board, if you're gonna do any kind of uh, rendering, you have four PCIe slots. Now, most of the time, the spacing on these, these two will get blocked. Yeah. So we wanted it to be a little bit longer so that you can fit four cards in there, right? And so today you may only be using one card. Maybe in a year you're using two cards. Maybe in a couple years you're up to four cards. We want it to be scalable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest part of TRX40 is that it's scalable in any direction. Like the board features all USB 3.2 Gen 2. Mm -hmm. You have four slots that are all usable by a full-size graphics card. Yeah. Uh, you have two 10 gig LAN. So even if you're not using 10G today, right. you may be using 10G tomorrow, right? And we were talking about this a little bit too. It's like a couple years ago, uh, everybody was on SATA and it's yeah. like, who's gonna use more than one SATA? Like it's so fast. But a couple years later and people are asking us for six SATA ports, for eight SATA ports. Same thing with M.2, right? So yeah. we wanted it to be as expandable as possible. We want you guys to figure out what makes sense for you. And we wanna be able to say, yes, our board's gonna be able to do that. You know, you want this to last, you want it to, um, you know, survive your, your environment. And, and evolve over time. I mean, I, I, I feel like there are a number of questions like, well, who do you think this motherboard is for? But the thing I wanna try and ask uh, uh, sort of around that, when I started building my Threadripper system, I had an idea of what I thought it was going to be. And by the time that system was up and running, that had already changed. And now what I'm looking at is a computer that I'm, I'm expecting it's gonna evolve for a while um, as I'm uh, rendering video and I'm editing YouTube clips and stuff like that. What are some of the challenges from Gigabyte's perspective? Threadripper is so broad. It's gotta be difficult to try and pin down. Well, we can say this is an enthusiast board. What does that even mean now? Cause that's wide open. Correct. So yeah, one of the major challenges is that you can use this like a Swiss army knife, right? You can use it for rendering, you can use it for streaming. We don't know what all the possibilities <laughs> of this platform are. And that's one of the coolest things, right? right? Gen 4, we're not using Gen 4 yet. There's Gen 4 graphics cards, but we're not even pushing the throughput no. of Gen 3. Yeah. So what is that gonna look like in two years? We don't necessarily know, but we wanted to be able to build a board that would slot into that, right? It's gonna, just as your use cases are gonna grow, this board will be able to support it. So whether it is the Gen 4, maybe you add another graphics card, maybe you add another M.2, maybe you start upgrading your home network to 10G, <laughs> whatever it is, we want the platform to be able to support that and not have to swap something out. You know, part of that too is the expandability of just the CPUs, right? Yeah. Right now we have 32 core. Coming up shortly, we're gonna have 64, 64 core. cores. So if you're gonna spend, you know, a, a couple hundred dollars, well, more than a couple hundred dollars on a board, you right. know, and a couple thousand on a CPU, in two years, if there's Gen 4 graphics cards, a 64, um, core CPU, maybe you do have 10G at home, right? You don't have to swap out the board. Yeah. You already have your platform. So we really kind of looked at this as a work truck or you know a semi truck, something that you're gonna use for a long time and can grow into whatever you're gonna use it for. And that's kind of the exciting thing about it is that we don't know where it's gonna go, but we want it to uh, be able to handle it and not have to worry about it, right? We built the VRM on this thing. Sure, it's gonna handle a 32 core, but we were thinking about 64 core. Right. 
and I feel like I personally have been on the sort of the wrong side of history a number of times, like picking out components that I thought, oh, there, I'll get a couple generations out of this. I'll be able to swap out some chipsets. Oh, they discontinued it. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> so from Gigabyte's perspective, it's it really is an argument in favor of upgradability over time. Absolutely, and I think AMD has also pushed that as well, right? With the longevity of AM4, uh, I know that this is a new socket, but we got at least two generations out of the last Threadripper. Right. We already have promised higher core count CPUs for this platform, so I think it is a longevity play, right? That you can build to what you need today with the option of upgrading later without having to throw the baby out with the bathwater, totally. right? And I think that's big for people, especially in workstation um, environments, right? You don't want to start over as much wow. as, you know. Downtime is expensive. And all the software upgrades, all the tweaks you've done to Windows. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, 10 yeah. years ago, I had no problem reinstalling Windows because it's just kind of a clean slate. Today, I have so many things that I've changed, so much right. software that I have running, all my networks connected. Like, it is a big pain to have to change out a platform. And totally. so um, I think the longevity of this platform and the upgradability is really the key selling point because we're not gonna be able to tap into 100% of this board today. You're not gonna be able to tap into 100% of the 32 cores today. today. But a year from now, two years from now, when software starts catching up, maybe your job expands. I don't know about your job, but my job, you seem to just get more hats, right? Right. Like I do this <laughs> and this and this, right? And so uh, as much as you know, things are expanding, um, we wanted a, a platform that you could continue to use through that. I feel like these have become that, that, uh, that premium showpiece from AMD and then from their partners to say like, sky's the limit. We, we don't even know where this is gonna go. Absolutely, and I, I think that's, it's a big shift in how we think about computing, right? Because it used to be a computer for a single task. And we have the same thing with our um, photographers and our video guys. Yeah. They used to do a video and then they walk away, they take a coffee break, you know, <laughs> right. they put a little sign on their computer that says, don't touch, Yeah. right? And so just shifting that mentality to know that you can render a video, you can do this, once people start to understand the possibilities of the platform is when they start to build the software that backs it up, right? Yeah. And so it's a chicken or the egg kind of question. And so in this case, we have the hardware and now we just need the software. We need all the use cases and they're there. We just haven't really thought about it like that yet. Yeah. You know, and as soon as people start thinking like that and like, oh, I can do this and this, right? I can cons consolidate down to one PC. I can stream, I can render a YouTube video at the same time. That way when I'm done with my stream, I upload. It's just gonna change workflows. And that takes a little bit of time, but when you have the tool there, it's like a light bulb moment. You're like, oh, oh I can do this, <laughs> right? Like I, I didn't think I could do this before, you know? And there's all these kind of unwritten rules in the back of our head of like, this is how we do it. But with this kind of a platform, you can start tweaking that and seeing, you know, what actually makes sense. How can I make the most time or most use out of my time. Well, and, and aiding in that, and thank you, that's the perfect segue to get me into my next question here on my sheet. The many, many connections, possible input, output, everything that goes into this board. I was hoping you could highlight some of that connectivity because this thing's an absolute monster. Yeah, well, my favorite is USB, right? The many names of USB. Right. The cool thing about this board is it's all USB 3.2 and it's all Gen 2. So basically it comes down to 10G, right? Like right. it's the 10G connection. You don't have to worry about which port you're plugging in. I hate looking on the back of the board and going, okay, this is a white port, this is a red <laughs> port, which <laughs> one is, right? So you have- I have four different USB connectors on my current board. Yeah, yeah. and then you get dongle, like I'm done yep. with dongles, right? I just, the promise of USB is I plug it in and it works and um, this board kind of unifies that. We wanted it to be simple, straightforward, and everything is what it is, right? So um, you have USB type A and type C. You also have the two 10G LAN. Obviously it'll still work at 1G if you don't have 10G yet. Um, we built in Wi-Fi, not because we expect people necessarily to use the Wi-Fi portion of it, but the mm -hmm. Bluetooth portion of it. Oh, interesting. I have a Bluetooth mouse. A lot of people have Bluetooth headsets. And again, right. as much connectivity as this board has, we don't want you to have to give up a USB port to plug in that little connector, Bluetooth, right? right. Um, we don't want you to have to use one of the PCIe slots to add in a Wi-Fi card. So it's like, why not put that in so that if you're gonna use it, 
you don't sacrifice something else. Gotcha. You know, and that's one of the cool things about Threadripper is that we're not here talking about like switching of the slots or anything. It just is what it is. If it's a 16x slot, it's a 16x slot, right? On top of that, of course, you have, you know, the eight different, the quad channel memory, and then you can plug in four different graphics cards. We have four M.2 built onto the motherboard, and then we have this cool little card, which looks right. like a graphics card, but underneath it are actually four M.2 slots within it, right? Um, so it can be actively or passively cooled. You can turn off the fan if you want. Uh, and the cool thing about this is you can set up rate. So you can Excellent. have your windows set up here. I was gonna ask about that, yeah. Right, and again, thinking of all the different uses that you're gonna have for this system, maybe you buy a couple of these, right? And you have them in the office. You can put your windows on a RAID here. Something goes wrong with windows, you just swap out this card, nice. right? You don't have to take off any of the screws. You don't have to mess with the internal. You're swapping a card, right? And so, um, we, like I said, we just wanted it to be as expandable and as, you know, if you wanna do it, you can probably do it with this board, right? And we wanted to be able to say yes when content creators said, hey, <laughs> I have this really weird edge case, wanna do it this yes. way, sure. <laughs> you know, and it makes my job easy when I just go, yeah, no yeah, problem. It'll do that. Yep. <laughs> I, I'm, again, talking about you know, jumping on the Threadripper train, how much that applied to me, where we used to have those. I'd have a big, you know, spinning disk drive, obviously you need that, and then I'd have a SATA drive, and how, from one computer gen to the next, it's like, I need multiple M.2s. Mm -hmm. And like, it, it wasn't just a, oh, it'd be nice. It'd be, no, I, got, no, I need that. that, that's a need. <laughs> right, and the, the hot swap is kind of cool. I know some uh, Linux guys that do VMs and kind of hot swap it around, but the other part of that, and we were talking about Gen 4 not being realized really yet, it's right. the, the connectivity's there, but we're still getting new devices. We're nowhere near the top of Gen 4 SSDs yet, right? right? We're middle of the pack. Well, and FX. you guys came out early with some pretty heavy hitting SSDs, mm -hmm. acknowledging that SSDs were still, there, there was still headroom to tap into. Oh yeah, and I'm sure you'll see some fun stuff at CES around that, right? 2020, we'll, uh, we'll, have, yeah. <laughs> we'll have a lot of uh, interesting stuff to do with Gen 4 and SSDs, but right now, you know, with the, the heat shields that we have on the motherboard, we're doing a pretty good job of not having to throttle SSDs. Nice. But you start pushing that speed up, and we don't know what that kind of um, heat headroom is gonna be. We don't know if you're gonna need active cooling gotcha. to fully get uh, SSD up to Gen 4 speeds, right? So we include something like this so that if the Gen 4 uh, SSDs do require active cooling, great, you don't need to upgrade your motherboard, right? You don't need to add a case fan or anything like that. So again, when we were going back to, uh, we really don't know all the possibilities of this, we tried to think ahead of what could be possible and build it in, and that way you don't have to swap out the board. Well, and also future-proofing on the idea that, let's say something extreme needs to happen, it's, it's a modular part. Mm -hmm. Another part could be designed and implemented to achieve that unknown if we cross that bridge and we determine that something needs to be more dramatic than what we currently have. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm excited about the possibilities because it's all over the place. I mean, right now we're hitting 15 gigs throughput um, on RAID 0. We're gonna blow past that in 2020. <laughs> blow past that in 2020. And because this is a full Gen 4 uh, add-in card, it'll support any new SSD that's on the market, right? So if there is a new controller, there is a higher speed, no problem, you Just don't need a new card. In. You pop it in and you That's get the speed. Awesome. So I, I do want to um, I do want to backtrack just a bit because we had kind of talked a little bit about the aesthetic and and some of the heat shielding and, and um, the RGBs. But I was hoping you could detail a little bit more on what went into the design of this aesthetic. I mean, it's got this very clean, but um, almost kind of armor plated look to it. And Oris being known as a gaming brand, what was the influence to bring some of that over into a more workstation focused? part. Well, we wanted to make sure that everything was functional. And on some of our gaming boards, right, there's a little bit of flair added in there and it looks good, but mm -hmm. it doesn't serve a purpose all the time. Right. On this board, because it is a workstation board, it is for content creators, we needed everything to be functional so that we could explain this is why we did it, right? We didn't just do it because it looks good. That was the secondary thought. We needed to make sure it worked well first. And so everything from like the armor here is mm -hmm. actually metal. Right, so even though we always have kind of an IO shield here, because it's metal, because it's touching the heat sink, 
it dissipates a little bit of heat, right? Same thing all the way down here. The entire board is metal. And metal, anytime it's touching something that's heating up, is acting um, as more surface area, right? So just like we do the finned VRM up here to give you as much surface area as possible, why not make the entire board a heat sink? And, and that also goes for the rear of the board as well, because mm -hmm. it's got that same kind of plating look to it. Yes, yeah, so we put armor on the back, well, we call it thermal armor. Right. Um, <laughs> but we put a back plate on it, and on that back plate, you have thermal pads that connect to the VRM, right? Because VRMs are obviously soaking heat both directions. The entire board um, PCB is gonna have some kind of heat coming off of it. So if we're gonna put a back plate on it, we might as well make it functional, yeah. right? And again, dissipate some of that heat and again, try to support those 64 core CPUs. Coming soon to a retailer near you. Yeah. Um, so in addition to the passive, uh, Oris has always had a great global view on, on cooling in general. And, and obviously there were some challenges with X570. I'm sure this is presenting some challenges too. What was Oris's approach to the, to the rest of the market for getting heat out of this system? Well, we needed to use every square millimeter is really what it came down to because we don't know how you're gonna configure it, right? If we're just talking about the CPU, sure, the VRM is gonna cover it. But what happens if you put four M.2s in here? What happens if you have all of the USB connected, right? And so we, have, we always approach it as like a worst case scenario, right? You have no airflow in your case. You have every M.2 possible you know, what's it gonna take to actually make that work? System is full. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we work backwards from there, right? So we do worst case scenario, and then we do most likely scenario, right? Maybe you have one or two M.2s, one or two graphics cards, uh, and then we have to tune the software and the BIOS around that, right? So like we have the chipset fan, I know we talked about that a lot with X570, you know, mm -hmm. people are worried about the chipset fan, but I think what people found out is that it depends on how you're using it. If you don't need it, the fan stays off. Right. If you need it, it'll be on low. I've never seen anybody actually be able to get it up to high uh, where it needed to be on like full speed. Maybe we'll get there in a couple years, but uh, the way we design the board is it'll adapt to what you plug into it. I do want to ask because because Threadripper is such a broad part, what was some of the Oris and Gigabyte approach to customizing the, the BIOS? like helping consumers and helping content creators really d dig into the nuts and bolts of what this, this platform has to offer. Well, starting with the X570, we totally redid our BIOS, which means we threw out everything and we started on a whiteboard. And the idea was for simplification. We mm -hmm. wanted it to be straightforward. We wanted people to be able to do what they want um, in an easily understandable way, right? And so before we were kind of criticized for having like the same option in three different menus and which one do I choose? Right. So we approach it as I've never looked at a Gigabyte BIOS before. <laughs> I want to do X. What's the simplest way to get there, right? And so instead of having to go three or four layers down, mm -hmm. now you can only, or you only have to go maybe one or two, right? We renamed a lot of things. And so we tried to simplify it to if this is the outcome you're looking for, this is the intuitive option that you would change. Mm -hmm. We loosely touched on this, uh, talking about some of the features on the board, but the Aorus label has been kind of linked with gaming. If we're talking about high performance P PC enthusiast builds, gaming, that, that's one of the first, uh, I think, first ideas that people come to. What was the Gigabyte approach to building out a Threadripper part and using that Aorus label on it as opposed to making this part of the Gigabyte ecosystem? Well, I'd say we really rolled out Oris maybe three or four years ago. It was on our laptops, and then we came out with this new branding, and we mm -hmm. kind of positioned it as our premium gaming brand. Well, as we've grown into that, I think we're starting to expand that a little bit more where it's just our premium brand. So nice. it no longer has to have that gaming um, tag in it. Mm -hmm. And this is part of that evolution. So can you game on Threadripper? Of course you can, <laughs> right? Like. 32 yeah. cores is going to handle it just fine. <laughs> um, if that's your primary purpose, though, this really isn't your platform. There right. are cheaper ways and perhaps even better ways if all you're doing is gaming. And so that, that is a bit of a, a philosophy shift then. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're using cars and trucks as an analogy, like there are Lexus sport utility vehicles, but there aren't Lexus heavy duty pickups. So th is, is this like the first step in, in that slight shift getting Oris away from just for gamers and more as the 
the, uh, the, the, the flagship tier product for Gigabyte. I think so. And I think even things like this add-in card, um, this add-in card comes with the board, but we're also starting to sell it separately. And I wouldn't oh, wow. consider this a gaming card, right? right? Like, you don't need four NVMe M.2 drives in RAID for gaming. No. <laughs> Again, it'll work. It'll work, but um, there's there perhaps are better ways to right. accomplish that, right? But we're starting to develop products like this, and you'll see like the little Oris uh, logo on there. Um, for more content creators, for more professionals, right? And so we're kind of repositioning it as our premium brand as opposed to the premium gaming brand. Well, and we talked about this a little with X570, and I'm sure Gigabyte has to be getting market feedback from, from consumers that gaming isn't just gaming mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, the, the uh, community experience now depends on your system's ability to not only present the game what you're playing, but then also share that in a very demanding way. Is, is this also sort of the mark of that as a changing time in the market, in the industry that Gigabyte is approaching? Everyone seems to be doing some low level multitasking and it's something that was very difficult in the past and now we just take it for granted that you fire up a browser, you play your game, you've got capture cards, you've got this, you've got that, and it all has to work at the same time. Yeah, and I think it's, um, the same kind of shift you saw where maybe five or six years ago, like you had a monitor, and maybe if you were lucky, you had a second monitor. It was a big deal when I got that second CRT. Yeah, <laughs> right. And now it's like when you see the battle station post, if it doesn't have right. three monitors, like what are you doing? What are you doing? Right? Um, and I think the same has kind of shifted for gaming, where it used to be, you know, you play a single player game. Even if you play a multiplayer game, you're on one screen, you're playing the game. Um, and then we started getting gaming peripherals, mm -hmm. and I think it's more of a shared experience now. You know, you don't have to be a professional Twitch streamer to stream on Twitch. Uh, a lot of people are uploading clips to YouTube, things like that, right? And so I think it's evolving where it's more about what can we do with the content that we're creating, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not at a professional level, right? right. So maybe you want to record it, maybe you have a capture card, maybe you're streaming it, maybe you just want to clip it and send it to your friends on Discord or whatever it is, right? And so we are starting to multitask and collect all of that data and then share it with other people. This is dating me a little <laughs> bit, but when I used to watch replays, you had to load a replay, load an audio commentary, they would do a countdown and you would sync, sync five, it. four, right. three, two, one, unpause, right? <laughs> so we're way past that, but now there's all kinds of integrations with the game as well, right? So you're watching a game and you can see, you know, all the different hero levels on the left-hand side. You can see what they just spent money. So we have all these overlays and things that are built in. And so you're not just watching the game anymore, right? It really is a production. Uh, it's almost more like watching, you know, a, a football game on TV than it is just watching, you know, mirroring somebody's screen. Right. And as you start, you know, integrating all of these different features, that's little things that your CPU is doing here, there, you know. Um, and so when you have more cores and you can set affinities to this or, you know, I'll give four cores to this, four cores to this. Right. When you got 32 cores, you can spread the cores around, you know? Well, and, and in your performance testing, have you seen that that we're getting over some of those, you know, for my generation of Threadripper, there are still those guides on how do you disable a chunk of the processor to improve gaming performance because of the way that memory's handled. Something tells me that Gigabyte has probably been playing with that on this new gen of Threadripper. Yeah, well, I think it's us and AMD. So when Threadripper first came out, it was, is pure workstation, right? We just, the title was 16 core, right? 32 core, <laughs> right. that's all we talked about. And then as people started using it, we kind of redefined how we were looking at it. So previous Threadrippers, you have the four chiplet design, right? And Windows would basically see that as two separate CPUs. Yeah. And that's why you got a lot of people disabling half of it because Windows really didn't know how to handle that, well, right? Well, the memory mesh got a little funky too. Yeah. yeah, on all the infinity fabric, right? So you're trying to cut down the latency. It's like, I'll take away half of the cores if I can speed up the other half, right? Yeah. So right. before our memory layout was what we called T topology which okay. was better for uh, multiple sticks of memory. And we looked at it and we saw that latency was really the, yeah. the linchpin. It was really what was holding people back. So we completely changed our layout to what's called daisy chain. Okay. Essentially what that does is it makes it for higher speeds to be possible, right? So before it was easier to get 128 gigs 
we changed our thinking to go, really we want more like 3,600, 3,800. Gotcha. So we changed our target. Um, when we were doing that, because we completely redesigned our memory and because we had so many layers on this board, we were actually able to do better at both. Nice. So it's one of those where we redefine the problem and what we were trying to accomplish. And by kind of starting over and redesigning everything, we ended up with a better product in both directions. So whether you want to do 128 gigs, fill up all eight sticks, right. uh, or you only want four with the you know tightest possible timings, we ended up with the solution that does both. And I think you'll see that on the CPU side and on our motherboard side. So Matt, I, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything else you want to share about the extreme and how extreme it really is? Well, you got to pick up the board to understand like all the features <laughs> we put in there. Well, right now our setup is, is very aesthetic. I am nervous to pick up the board because I don't know I'd be able to get it back. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but so like little things, I mean, we really thought of uh, use case and what would be cool to put on a motherboard, not just cool like, oh, that's going to look good, but kind of change how we think of motherboards, mm -hmm. right? So before you'd have like the little round power and reset button, totally right. functional, but like, why don't we just make it a little more aesthetically pleasing and you get that tactile click. I'm a blue key guy, so like that tactile <laughs> click is a big deal for me. For sure. And then we made almost everything right angled here. So all of your SATA connections are right here. Your USB 3.0 connections are right here. Your 24 pin is right here. And we indented a little bit because you have, you know, that sheathing that comes off right. of it, right? All of your fan headers are here. So if you just want to see the board as is with a CPU cooler and you don't want cables running everywhere, you connect everything over here, right? Um, and so little things like that that we changed. Uh, the debug LED is a little bit bigger, a little bit brighter, you mm -hmm. know? Um, we really did try to think of how can we take this from what we've done before and what people expect and make it feel better out of the box, right? So the first time you plug this in, if you've ever had a previous Aorus product, mm -hmm. you'll instantly know it's an Aorus product. Right. But when you get it all powered up and you step back and you look at it, you'll feel like it is the latest generation, the top flagship and um, all the little details that are involved in it. Well, it's been an exciting board to cover. I, as we wrap up this conversation, I, you already gave us one pretty good tease. What should we be on the lookout for as we're getting uh, close to the next year of conventions and uh, tech shows? Is there something that, because it's been a tradition in our streams that <laughs> you at least give us a good tease. What, what, is, what does Gigabyte have coming down the pipe? Well, I think this year we expanded a lot, right? We did monitors, we mm -hmm. did SSDs. We really stepped up our game on motherboards on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and I think you're just going to see that expand, right? So whereas before maybe we had two or three versions of something, you're going to see five or six versions next year, right? Uh, and the cool thing about the way that we've done it is that we've put all the R&D into the very top end and then it starts to cycle down, right? Nice. So we've started with uh, like our monitors, the yeah. AD27QD. We've still been getting great feedback it's on It's always monitors. sold out. Yeah. Um, but we put all the R&D and all the features, everything we could possibly want into that and now we can kind of pick it apart and go, okay, this particular group really likes this feature, let's improve on it, right? This group um, maybe wants us to focus more on the HDR or the this. So we can take all of that experience that we've learned and start to refine it. And so I think um, this next year you'll see the second generation of a lot of products. Nice. Uh, with a lot of little refinements. You know, I say this almost every time I come in here. I spend <laughs> a lot of time reading YouTube, Reddit. We collect all that data. Um, and then we try to implement it in the next version. So if you've left a comment out there, if there's something that you wanted to tweak, uh, stay tuned for next year and see if that made it into the final product because I bet you'd be amazed at how much uh, we actually take that feedback to heart. Well, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time. I, these are some of my favorite conversations and getting to kind of dig in a little deeper and that you give us some actual behind the scenes on what's going on with the Gigabyte crew. So thanks so much for showing Absolutely, showing it's up. always a pleasure. All right, folks, that's gonna do it for us here. This is a, a moving target. Threadripper is such an exciting part and the ecosystem around Threadripper is really exciting too, especially being a fan of Threadripper. So if uh, you want more information on Threadripper parts or specifically this Aorus Extreme board, you can check the links down below in the description for this video. For Newegg Studios, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, and I'll catch you all on the next video.